I've had many different paranormal encounters, but this one has been seared into my memory due to the extraordinary nature of it. Eight years ago, me and some friends decided to go to Las Vegas for a weekend getaway filled with pool parties, gambling and booze. We chose to stay at the Flamingo Hotel, one of the oldest resorts on the Las Vegas Strip. It's a Friday when we arrive and we instantly get ready for the nighttime activities. We go out, grab some drinks, and return back to the hotel for some gambling. Whilst there, we run into another group of friends and have a blast. We are at tables, placing big bets, smoking cigarettes, and living our best lives. After a couple of hours, we decide to go and have something to eat at a restaurant in the hotel. Whilst there, I had to make my way to the nearest ladies' room. The server gave me some funky directions to a bathroom towards the back of the hotel. I didn't think much of it and went to go find it. I arrived at a tiny restroom towards the back corner of the hotel. For a Friday it was empty. I found this strange as I was expecting to see a line of women and the obligatory drunk person heaving their insides into the toilet. Again I brushed it off, did my business and went to wash my hands. After I left the sink I stood in front of a large vanity mirror to fix my lipstick. As I was pulling my lipstick out of my purse I could smell cigar smoke. I lifted my head and looked into the mirror. A man was standing behind me. He was wearing a black fedora hat, a black suit reminiscent of the 1940s, and was with a cigar in his mouth. I was paralysed and turned around slowly to face what I thought to be some sort of assailant. Once I'd fully turned, he'd completely vanished. The smell of cigar had also completely dissipated. Even at that moment, I thought I'd imagined it all. I ran back to my group who asked me why I'd been so long, and if I'd gone back to California to use the bathroom. Then I started telling them the story of what I'd just seen. They brushed it off and teased me over it, but the server had overheard me and explained to me that I may have seen Bugsy Seagull, a mob boss who used to run the hotel. He further stated that other people had seen things from time to time. I politely smiled and went back to try and eat my food. I couldn't get the image of him out of my mind. I decided to go back to my hotel room, alone. Everyone else carried on with their night, all night, and I felt I would be more comfortable and safer in my hotel room. I changed out of my clothes for the night and sat on a chair facing the Las Vegas Strip. I poured myself some champagne and watched people as they walked along the Strip. As I'm staring out of the window, I started to smell a familiar and distinct odour. Cigar smoke. I turned to see a figure standing in the shadows of the doorway. It was him. Black fedora hat, black suit, cigar in hand. I saw him very clearly, this solid looking being. He was not transparent, there was no light illuminating from his face or body. He looked as real as you and me. I was frozen and I could hear my heart palpitate. He took the cigar from his mouth and hung his hand with the cigar at his side. With his other hand, he put his thumb up against his chest. He stood in this stance for not more than a few seconds. He raised his cigar back to his mouth and instantly vanished. Once he was gone, I turned on every light in the room. It was as if there was never a presence in the room to begin with. I told my friends who again thought I was crazy. I know what I saw, and it was real. I don't know why he followed me that night and I've been back to Vegas multiple times since, and I haven't had another encounter like that. I wonder now if it really was Bugsy Seigal himself. If so, I had encountered the ghost of one of the biggest mob bosses in history. Shortly after college, I decided to rent a room from my brother. He owned a second house about 40 minutes away in a more rural part of town, where he also worked, so I had the house to myself most of the time. I had been living there for a few months, with nothing out of the ordinary happening until a few strange occurrences started happening. One day I was in the shower and I heard footsteps, which I thought nothing of due to my brother being in and out of the house all the time. But when I got out of the shower and went to the living room, he wasn't home, so I figured I'd just missed him. So I went on about my business getting ready for work, and when I walked down the hall coming out of the bedroom I was renting, the door slammed shut behind me. 
I looked back and my bedroom door was closed. For context, the hall has two bedrooms at the end. One is diagonally laid into the corner of the hall, into the larger master, my room, and the other goes straight into the hallway. It was mine that had closed behind me. I then started to become a little more alert, but still just chalked it up to a draft in the house or something. That night I'd gotten back home from work, when the doorbell rang, but when I answered the door there was no one there. I looked around outside for a second to see if I was being ding-dong ditched, but there was no sign of anyone at all. I went back into the house and texted my brother, asking if he had been by today, and he said no. I told him I thought I heard the doorbell ring, and he told me it wasn't even hooked up. I went into the dining room, and sure enough, the components of the doorbell were sitting there on the table. Now I'm on full alert. The next couple of days went by without anything terribly eventful happening. Several times I thought I heard footsteps, and even the sound of a faint voice, but it was always while I was in the shower. After a few days had passed, I was getting ready to leave for work again. I'd completely misplaced my cell phone and looked everywhere for it, but I couldn't find it. Thankfully, this was several years ago when most people still had landline phones, so I used my brother's house phone to call mine. I heard it ringing in the sitting room by the front door, so I put the receiver down on the table and started to walk towards the sound of my phone. I walked down the hall, through the dining room, and finally around the corner in the sitting room by the front door. When I walked into the sitting room, the phone stopped ringing abruptly. I could see it sitting on the end table so I picked it up and went back to the other room to hang up the other phone. When I walked back to the landline to hang it up, it was already done. I recounted my steps, wondering whether I'd accidentally hung up after calling, but I followed the ring across three rooms of the house, so there's just no way. That night my brother was at the house and I asked if he's ever heard anything weird, and he said no. I asked if he knew anything about the previous owner of the house, and if they were still alive and he told me that just last week the family of the previous owner had stopped by and told him that the woman who lived here had died and asked if they could spread her ashes on the waterfront in the backyard, because she lived there for thirty years, and that's where she wanted to be laid to rest. I must have turned white or something, because his reaction was to look at me and say, Why? You're freaking me out. I heard footsteps while I was in the shower for another week or so after that, then they stopped. I've never believed in that kind of stuff, but this was truly bizarre. This story involves one of my great-grandparents on my dad's side. I was never really close to this side of the family but once in a while my great-grandma would take the eldest grandchild on a two-week-long vacation. She did this with my second cousins as well. It was my turn and this was the first time really being away from my family for that length of time, and I wasn't too thrilled about it. But I didn't mind the idea of being spoiled by my great-grandparents though. My great-grandma was a little rough around the edges, but had a good heart, and my great-grandpa was a beast. He'd had a stroke years and years before I'd ever met him, and that had left his speech impaired. Other than that, though, he was kind and generous and, like I said, a beast of a man. He adored me and my sister and always called us pretty girls. I loved it. Their house was, I think, built in the 50s. There was still wallpaper from the 60s in some of the rooms and I absolutely loved this house, even if it was creepy as hell. My great-grandmother was a bit of a hoarder, and had a ton of things that had been passed down to her from her great-grandparents, things that probably should have been in a museum. There was a wheelchair from the early 1900s, a baby carriage from the 1890s, letters from Lincoln before he was president, helmets from WW1, all sorts. The basement walls were lined with books older than dirt. I spent hours down there thumbing through some very rare first edition books. I firmly believe that a lot of those antiques and things I firmly believe that a lot of those antiques had things attached to them. At the back of the basement was a room that connected to a room with a hot tub. It was generally used for storage, but had a bed and it was where I was supposed to sleep during my stay. My first night there was terrifying. 
The door was an accordion door, and kind of flimsy. I distinctly remember it was a Saturday night, because it was mad TV night. My parents watched it every weekend. So I'm in my room trying to get to sleep, and I can hear my great-grandpa in his room down in the basement snoring away. I could hear my great-grandmother moving around in her room directly at the top of the stairs. It goes quiet, and I eventually hear her start to snore as well. I can't sleep. The big glass doors leading to the hot tub room are pitch black since they lead to the outside. It's now about midnight and I have to pee, so I reach out through the partially opened accordion door to flip the switch on so I can walk across the basement to the stairs without being a scared little eleven year old. I was halfway across the basement and the light goes off. I ran so fast back to my room I'm not even sure my feet touched the floor. My heart was pounding out of my chest and all I wanted to do is call my mum. I took a deep breath, turn the light on again, and book it to the stairs. As I reach the top, the light flicks off again. At this point, I'm thinking maybe it's my great-grandpa messing with me. Nope, I can still hear him snoring away in his room. I reach for the doorknob to get into the upstairs hallway and discover the door is locked. Crap. Okay, deep breath. That means I need to go back downstairs to use my great-grandpa's bathroom which I really didn't want to do. I'm fully panicking at this point. Then, I hear someone walking across the basement. Soft, thudding footsteps. I'm scared to the point that I think I'm about to wet my pants. I call out for my grandpa to stop, but his snoring doesn't falter. It's not him. I end up booking it back to my room and I call my house. My mum answers and tells me I'm being silly, and I just need to get used to it as it's my first real time away from home. I slept with the light on that night. The next night, after having relayed what happened to my grandparents, they told me I can sleep out in the enclosed gazebo that my dad and his brothers used to sleep in when they were kids. Yay, I don't have to sleep in that creepy-ass basement. I'm set up on a small cot, it's about midnight again, and I can hear someone in the yard. Now they had a huge backyard, they grew all sorts of vegetables and fruits, and they even had a small little cornfield. I would spend my days in the yard reading and picking fruit off of the trees to nibble on. I loved it. I peeked out of the window and shone my flashlight down into the cornfield, and I see it. There's someone darting into the corn. What the heck? I turn off the light and let my eyes adjust to the dark. The porch light is just about bright enough to see the corn moving. I'd been around long enough to know that only a big-ass animal or a person could make the corn move like that. I wait. The corn continues to move until whatever was in there makes it to the edge closest to the house. It stops. I wait. I shine my light down and it moves back towards the way it came. The edge of the corn opens up like someone is pushing their way out. My light is trained on that spot but nothing came out. A few seconds go by and I hear it. Someone is walking up the wooden stairs leading to the little walkway to the gazebo. I'm in full panic mode and I start to flash my flashlight into my grandmother's room. She pokes out her head and I tell her I'm scared, and by this point the sound has stopped. She moves me to the living room on the opposite side of the house so I can sleep on the couch. I'm still scared, but my adrenaline has drained me and I'm just ready to go to sleep. After a few hours, I wake up to use the bathroom. Their cat is on my chest, which I find insanely bizarre as the cats are usually locked in the kitchen or the basement at night. Whatever, I have to pee. I walk down the hall and the basement door opens, slowly, but it opens. I know it opened. I watched it open. What the heck? Why is the basement door opening? Grandpa's asleep and I can hear him snoring. I can hear Grandma snoring. The cat that had been on my chest is sitting at the end of the hallway where I'd just come from and is now growling. It's not hissing, but just a deep little kitty growl. I say out loud, Leave me alone, I have to pee. Then the door closes. Holy hell, I try to calmly walk to the bathroom and do my business. I take a few more minutes to try to compose myself, and when I open the door, the cat that had followed me is sitting in front of it, staring at the basement door, so I book it back to the living room and get nestled up in my blankets on the couch. I end up turning on the TV so I can distract myself, but as I start falling asleep to some late night infomercial, 
The light goes out, the TV goes off, and I hear someone say, No, it's late. I'm hysterical. I sneak into my grandma's room with my blankets and sleep on the floor. She wasn't too thrilled I was on her floor in the morning, but I don't care. In the morning we finally embark on our little road trip to the coast, and I don't have to sleep in that terrifying house again. When I finally get back to my house I relay what happened to my family and my mum teases me. My dad tells me that he had had a few similar experiences when he stayed there as a kid, and years later when my older brother lived there. He told me that he'd had some pretty scary things happen to him and his girlfriend. I loved that house during the day, and I hate that they tore it down. I don't think I'd ever have spent the night there as an adult. I have no idea how my grandparents dealt with living there. My dad said they probably dismissed anything that happened as them seeing things or just getting old. Both of those great-grandparents died in that house, and they've since built two multi-million dollar homes on the property. I hope that my great-grandparents are in a better place now, or at the very least haunting that property and terrifying the families in those gaudy, ridiculous homes. I've posted on here before about a girl named Sally that I was best friends with and who I'd had a lot of paranormal encounters with. I posted my first and by far scariest encounter on here as well and was asked to post another. So here's another scary encounter that I've had and it's all very real and very true. Enjoy. So I'm going to be introducing another girl into our little friend group. Let's call her Lisa. Lisa is Sally's cousin who was from a different town and I had just met her. We hit it off right away. Sally lives just on the outside of our town, so it's a little secluded. Down the road from her house is a very long road surrounded by a wooded area which led up to a bridge. It's where all the kids in town would go to swim and play. Nobody liked to walk this very long road, mainly because of bears, so everyone would look for a ride. Sally and I would walk as it's just down the road from her house. A lot of people had died here at this bridge. They'd either accidentally drowned or committed suicide. Now at the start of this long road leading to the bridge, there are no houses, just trees all around, and there's also no street lights, not even on the bridge. It's in complete darkness. One day we were all hanging out together, Sally, Lisa, Faith and me. I don't remember much about what we were doing that day, but all we were pretty much doing was running around the streets. We'd go through trails around the back of her house and maybe decide to go swimming at the bridge. That night we all decided it was a good idea to go for a night swim. We used to do it all the time, but only when we were able to get a ride. But this day Sally said that she wanted to walk. So we started walking and Sally and Faith started walking a little bit faster than Lisa and I. We're having fun talking and walking and Sally and Faith were about to go past the last street light before going down the long pitch black road. Lisa and I were way behind so we called out that we'd meet them there and they yelled back and said okay. Then off into the darkness they went. Lisa and I are about one street light behind the last light and we're talking about smoking weed and stuff like that. Then we suddenly hear Sally and Faith scream at the top of their lungs. Lisa and I looked at each other and ran straight for them, as we thought it was probably a bear. We started yelling for them, asking if they were okay, as we got to the last streetlight, and we saw two figures running towards us. It was Sally and Faith. Then I saw another figure behind them. It was a very tall figure. Sally and Faith both started to scream again, except they were screaming at us to run the other way. Lisa and I were a bit confused, but we turned around and started to jog back to Sally's house. Sally and Faith caught up to us and passed us they were running so fast. At this moment we're about two street lights behind the last one and I decided to look back. I can see a tall shadow just before the last street light, standing there in the dark. Then it disappeared. I never yelled so loud in my life at someone who was just right next to me. Fucking run! I screamed at Lisa, and we booked it back to Sally's place without looking back. We gathered ourselves when we got to Sally's and tried to figure out what we'd just seen. 
I guess when Sally and Faith were walking in the dark, they'd seen a tall man walking towards them, and at the time didn't think anything of it, as they thought it was just someone walking back from swimming. Then she said he'd started running towards them, so they screamed and booked it the other way towards the light. We never walked down that way in the dark ever again. Faith and I lost touch and Sally passed away, but Lisa and I still talk about it to this day. She said it's the only experience she's ever had, and hopefully it's her last. Something cut me. So this is my first time really sharing this experience. It's completely true and I'm hoping to maybe find answers, I guess. I don't know. I should start at the beginning. I was in sixth grade at the time and I was raised by an abusive single mum. We were very poor and we shared a room in a ranch style house with my grandma and great grandfather. I was constantly bullied at school and turned into somewhat of a goth. I was going through a bad phase where I was acting out and I figured that if the people bullying me didn't get in trouble, I might as well act out too. This spiralled into an atheist phase. I wasn't truly an atheist, but was just trying to get a reaction out of people. I wanted someone to give me a bit of attention and show that I mattered, I guess. Overly dramatic pre-teen style. I started proclaiming how I hated God in an attempt to get a reaction out of the few people who actually did talk to me. Looking back, I can kind of see why I wasn't liked. Anyway, one night I was sound asleep, when I woke up with an electric start. I wasn't groggy, I was just instantly awake. You know that feeling when you think you're about to roll off the edge of your bed? You jolt, but you're not really falling off the bed. Well, that's what happened, except minus the falling sensation. My mum was in the room too, sleeping peacefully. I looked up and there was this blue and white light, like when you look at a traffic light through a rainy windshield. It was right over the end of my bed and coming towards me. Immediately after seeing it, it was like I was in a trance, and I reached up to touch it. While I was reaching, my mind was screaming at me not to touch it. But I couldn't stop myself, and it was like sleeping beauty in the spinning wheel. Cliché, I know. When I made contact, whatever the ball was, it instantly cut my thumb, deep and clean like a razor blade. I screamed and the ball disappeared. I fumbled in the dark and turned the light on. My mum started yelling at me to shut up, so I tried to explain what had happened, but she didn't care or even believe me. I walked down the hall to the bathroom. I was feeling a bit dizzy at this point, and I wrapped my thumb in toilet paper. I started to feel very sleepy, so I went back to my room. I looked around for anything that could have cut me, and there was nothing. The whole atmosphere had changed, and it wasn't scary or heavy anymore, and the presence was gone. I went to bed, and when I woke up the next day, the cut was still there and extremely deep. I had a faint scar for years. I expected it to be gone by the time I'd woken up, but it wasn't. Has anyone else experienced something similar? Could it have been because I denounced God? I have no idea what it was. The other night I jolted awake again and I had a weird gut feeling that the weird light ball was back. I didn't see it again, but now I'm afraid it may visit one of my daughters. Some backstory for context. At the age of three, my grandma was hit by a truck and the impact crushed all the bones, muscles and nerves in her foot. She had emergency surgery where they took a muscle from her thigh and grafted it to her foot so she could still function. This played a massive role in her life, not being able to walk properly, hold a job for very long and look after her kids to the full extent. My pop on the other hand was a fit man even at the age of almost 80, he was still out walking up to 5 kilometers a day. He worked as a builder, truck driver, sheet metal fabricator, and plastic molding throughout his life. He retired and took full care of Grandma at the age of 70. In 2014, Grandma's foot got infected and she went into a coma for 13 days. 
Pop said his goodbyes and went through the hard times, but Grandma thankfully recovered. In 2015, my grandma's foot got infected again and she had to have it amputated. Doctors gave her a 20% chance of waking up after the surgery, so we all said our goodbyes, were really sad and preparing for the worst. But Pop kept making the mood light and was cheering up all the great grandkids. That was the kind of person he was. All his family loved him to bits and he was the greatest man ever. Grandma survived again, and through all this hard time, Pop was the one that held the family together when he had every right to be the one hurting the most. In 2017, Pop was diagnosed with asbestos lung cancer from all those years working as a builder. He kept his high spirits even at a time where he had been given a time frame. My wife and our family live in a different state, so in September 2017, we videoed Grandma and Pop and told them that they are to expect another great grandbaby. Pop burst into tears as he was so excited. He just loved children. All the kids in the neighborhood knew of George. Fast forward to March and we've had our little girl. Pop is so excited to meet her. We pack up the car with our oldest and our newborn and set out on the journey to visit them. On our way there, we get a phone call telling us that Pop has gone into hospital and is in bad health. Pop called us and told us he has made the hard but necessary decision to not let any of the great grandkids see him in this condition. I still go and visit him and we have a good chat. I video call my wife so he can see the baby. He is so heartbroken that he didn't get to hold his youngest great grandchild, but knows it was the right decision to make. That's the kind of person he was. He didn't want the baby to get sick from the hospital. A few weeks later I was cooking dinner when my daughter who is now three weeks old randomly started hysterically laughing for the first time. Not twenty minutes later we got a phone call from mum and it was one of those feelings you get when you know exactly what the call is about. Pop had passed away about half an hour ago. My wife and I have a cry but our baby can't stop laughing. I know my pop was there and finally got to talk and play with his youngest grandbaby. It was his way of saying to us to not be sad. We miss him dearly and have a picture of him on our wall, so our girls grow up knowing who he was. I'm so grateful for Pop's last visit. Okay, so that last one wasn't scary. But a good story all the same. Merry Christmas fearsome friends and here's to a great year ahead. If you don't mind clicking that subscribe button that would make me really happy. Love to you all and remember keep being creepy.